get started. Uh, my name is uh, Kevin Hennessy, as I've already been introduced. And I'm with Applied Information Sciences, which is a consulting firm based out of Washington, D.C. We have a Raleigh office, and, and I'm in the Raleigh office. And today I'll be talking about uh, Angular 2, a beginner's guide. And the agenda for today is, uh, first of all, we'll talk about why is there need for a new version of Angular. Second, we'll take a look at the design for Angular 2.0. Uh, we'll touch on browser support, which is pretty critical to making a decision as to whether to use Angular 2.0. Uh, and then we'll get, discuss briefly some of the new and emerging technologies that are being leveraged by Angular 2, and those include web components, ES6, the new version of JavaScript, and TypeScript. And then we'll take a look at a demo which is intended to sort of exercise Angular 2.0 to the point that it's now uh, built out. And it's really going to be from the perspective of a developer like me trying to make use of this framework which is supposed to make uh, life easier for developers. Let me get that out of here. And then we'll finish up with uh, a discussion of what's next with Angular 2. As many of you probably know, Angular 2 is still in alpha release. I think at this point we're up to maybe 44 or 45. The beta release is imminent, but uh, we're not there yet, and certainly not near the final release. So why a new version of Angular? Well, first of all, Angular came out uh, more than six years ago. And in web years, that's, uh, that's a more than a lifetime. And so a lot has changed in the last six years. Uh, first of all, uh, ES6, uh, it's also called ES2015, is going to transform JavaScript programming. And web components are on their way. We know that they're not supported in the browsers completely, but they're definitely an emerging trend. Uh, Angular is going to need a new implementation, implementation of data binding. And that uh, has, <coughs> is uh, in no small measure because of the performance implications of that. Uh, Angular was not designed for mobile apps. There are performance issues, inability to cache pre-compiled views, and lackluster touch support. I'm not going to spend a lot of time listing all these things that might not be right with Angular 1. This is not an Angular 1 talk, and I'm sure there are a lot of you in the room who are, have worked with Angular 1 and enjoyed using the framework. Uh, but Angular uh, fundamentally needs to be easier to learn uh, and it needs to adapt to new and emerging trends in web technologies. And I think that's principally why we're talking about a new version of Angular. The Angular 2.0 design uh, starts out with a modular, mobile-first approach uh, that should also scale for the desktop. So as I was saying a minute ago with Angular 1, six years ago this was less of a concern. Obviously, it's a, it's a big uh, concern and an issue being able to develop mobile-first designs and also scale. Uh, there'll be support for web components out of the box. We'll see a lot of that as we go through uh, the, the demo. And it is now built using TypeScript uh, with easy transpilation to ES5. This is a transition that was made in the process of developing Angular 2, but the uh, Angular 2 now has been rewritten with TypeScript. And the, uh, sample app that I'll be showing is built with TypeScript, and we'll see how that uh, works in Angular 2. Now, that's not to say that you can't use ES6 and ES5 with Angular 2, and in fact, uh, there are plenty of examples out there of folks working with ES6. ES5 may be a bit more of a challenge, uh, to be perfectly frank, but uh, it is available as an option in developing with Angular 2. Uh, there's a new data binding implementation of, for Angular 2, and you've probably heard something about this because uh, the initial message was that it was Angular 2 was only going to support one-way data binding. And of course, one of the things that has been a hallmark of Angular 1 is that it supports two-way data binding. And so we'll see 
um, what that's all about. But this has been influenced by some of the newer frameworks like React, and the desire is to improve performance. So we're going to see a new way of, um, of data binding. Uh, and then there are a lot of things that will start to go away. It won't rely on JQLite or DOM wrappers in general. It's going to be simplified and a lot of these things that you may be familiar with, scope and controller in Angular 1, they all go away. And, and the desire is to simplify the learning process for Angular 2. So let's talk a little bit about browser support because that's uh, uh, an issue that, as I said a few minutes ago, is something that you'll want to bear in mind as you make a decision as to whether to use Angular 2. Angular 2, uh, the initial announcements was that it was only supporting uh, evergreen browsers, those that auto-update, and so the typical browsers like Chrome, Firefox, et cetera, <coughs> as well as IE 11 that auto-update uh, are supported by Angular 2. There's been a recent announcement of support for IE 9 and 10, which is uh, a welcome development probably for many who have to develop uh, for those browsers. And then on the mobile side, uh, you have Chrome on Android, iOS 7 and above, Windows Phone 8 and above. And then another announcement that just came out recently that there's support for older versions of Android going back to 4.1. So uh, what you can do is actually go to the GitHub repository for Angular, which is Angular slash Angular, Angular 2's repository. And they've got a, they've got a graphic out there that'll show you uh, the emerging levels of support. Now, one thing to bear in mind is if you're uh, developing <coughs> applications for older browsers, then, then Angular 2 is probably not your choice. Uh, so let's take a look at some of what makes up Angular 2 and, and, and what foundations it's built on. The first is web components. And web components is actually an umbrella term for four different W3C specs, custom elements, HTML templates, Shadow DOM and HTML imports. And basically what it provides is, is composability, encapsulation, all of those things that we as developers know as good component development. Uh, in Angular 2, we'll see all of these things except for HTML imports. And one thing to bear in mind, of course, is as many of you know, is that browser support for web components is not uh, nearly complete at this point. Uh, what's emerging now is uh, support for Shadow DOM, and that is used in Angular 2. Uh, but other things like custom elements, HTML templates, uh, those are uh, less widely supported in the browser. So what you'll see is that Angular 2 is using the web components uh, approach to developing their platform, but what they're doing at the same time, of course, is providing uh, polyfills and, and support for what I guess you would call Angular 2 components, which make it possible to develop components uh, in the current state of the web, including uh, for those older browsers that were just mentioned. ECMAScript 6 j just came along. It was just adopted in July. Uh, it's, uh, it's a welcome development. Pretty amazing that it actually did reach uh, uh, adoption stage after quite a few years. And for our purposes today, it, what ECMAScript 6 or ES 2015 provides is classes, uh, which is a, obviously a, a new development with JavaScript and a module system. And there's a lot more to ES 6. We won't have time to go into it in the, in the uh, session today. But the primary focus, as I said, will be on classes and module systems. And Echoing what I said a few minutes ago, you can still use ES5 with Angular 2, though uh, most of what you see out there is using either ES6 or TypeScript at this point. So on to TypeScript. Uh, rather obviously, it provides static typing for JavaScript. And it, there's been a Microsoft-Google collaboration around this, which is uh, Pretty fascinating to me. Uh, Microsoft has added what are called decorators to TypeScript. And, and the TypeScript version that's out there now, 1.6, has support for decorators, which are 
uh, were earlier called annotations. And uh, we'll see some of that as we look at the code, but that's an integral part of Angular 2. And, um, and as I was mentioning a few minutes ago, Angular 2 was actually, is actually built with TypeScript. In the course of developing Angular 2, they ported uh, their code base into TypeScript. So uh, there's, a, there's a very strong linkage between uh, Angular 2 and TypeScript at this point. And uh, pretty amazing Microsoft and Google getting together on something like this. Again, the use of TypeScript is optional. Uh, you don't have to use it. But uh, the examples that we'll be looking at today uh, actually do use TypeScript. So let me uh, bring up a sample app. And I'm hopeful that you'll be able to see it in the browser, in the uh, overhead. But basically, my purpose in putting this together was to um, just exercise Angular 2 and see what you could do with it at this stage of development. And I've been speaking on Angular 2 for about the last four or five months, and I can say when I first started, you couldn't do anything like this. It was too unstable. But what I've done is created a small app here. I'm a rose gardener uh, when I have some free time from coding. And this app uh, just steps you through uh, sort of a fictitious scenario of developing a rose garden and putting together the pieces of planting your garden and picking your roses and purchasing them. And so on the first screen, there's a get started welcome. It's welcoming me. The assumption is I've already logged in so that the app has some information about me. Uh, on the next screen, uh, I can make choices as to uh, the dimensions of my garden. Is that visible from back? Yeah, I think I can. Yep. Is that any better? Yeah, let me just go back to the previous <coughs> screen. So on this screen, what you're able to do is just establish the dimensions for your garden. And it's a sort of an artificial construct, but it basically shows that you can update uh, these these drop downs here with choices and then it automatically updates things like the square footage and the maximum number of roses that are available. On the next screen you can make selections as to your uh, roses. You can add a rose bush. <coughs> there are cascading drop downs. You can enter the amount. Oh, whoops, it says I've had too much so I got to back this off. And then you can complete your purchase of the roses um, on this checkout screen. There's a little bit of, of uh, validation here. Last names. And then you can finish up and submit. And keys is malfunctioning. And you can see our order having been placed. Shows the amount and the roses that you've purchased. So, so basically what you're seeing here is uh, a modest app that, that allows you to complete a few steps in a purchasing process. And it's uh, completely built with Angular 2. And before I dive into the code, one thing that I was going to, a couple things I was going to say. First of all, I'm using uh, Materialize uh, CSS. Uh, I'm not using Material Design. Material Design is coming as part of Angular 2, but it's not quite here yet. So I'm uh, just using that as a sort of a polyfill for the moment. And uh, to understand Angular 2, you really have to think about uh, components from the very beginning. Uh, one thing I found when I started to develop this small app is that I immediately started to think how to organize uh, the application into components. And if you look at the screen here, what you see at the very top is what's called 
uh, is the display for what's called a root component. Uh, Angular 2 has this concept of component hierarchies where you've got a tree of components with a single root component and then you have child components that branch out from there. And so in this case, what you're seeing visually is the display by the root component. It's got the, you know, the overall navigation set up here. And then within each of, each of the screens that you see that we were just looking at a few minutes ago, these are all, these are all uh, child components of the parent component. And routing uh, takes place, uh, Angular 2 actually uses component-based routing. And so everything that you're seeing with an Angular app uh, is very much dictated by component design. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna try as best I can to show some code. See what we can do. Are you able to see that? Okay. Uh, what I'm starting with is the simplest of the screens, the welcome screen, so that you can get a sense of how an Angular component is uh, created. And, and this screen is not doing a whole lot. It's actually just displaying my name and, and um, placing a, a, a a link into the screen to, to enable navigation. So, um, but this will give you an idea of, of the basics of an Angular component. And so at the top of the screen here, this is a TypeScript file, uh, you have imports. Now these are using ES6 module loading uh, and it's bringing in selectively what it needs from Angular 2. So in this case, it, we only need uh, the view module and the component module from Angular 2. What we also need is something called the router link, and we'll take a look at routing uh, in a minute. And that comes in from the Angular 2 router. And then we have something called the shopping cart service, which is a service that, uh, that I developed, which uh, it keeps track of the customer and the purchases and so forth. We, we'll take a look at it in, in just a minute. And then uh, that's the starting point for creating your component. And then you have annotations, or decorators, I should say. They used to be annotations, they're now decorators, on a, on a simple class. And so this is, this is now using TypeScript an, an, uh, decorators. And the two fundamental decorators are component and view. And component uh, has properties uh, in this case, it's fairly simple. It just has a selector. So this is telling Angular 2 where to inject uh, this particular component in the screen. And, and then there is a view directive that uh, points to uh, either an inline template, uh, so it would just be uh, HTML that would be right here, or you can point to an external file. And in this case, I'm pointing to an external file. And then there are imports of directives, uh, in this case, the router link that's part of the routing configuration. And the component itself just has, uh, is a very simple class. Uh, there's a, my name, which is a string. Uh, we're doing some dependency injection here with the shopping cart service. And then we're uh, assigning the name to my name. And so, this is what you then see on the screen. Oops, let me get to the right place. And it, it's able to display my name and then this is the router link. So this is sort of the fundamental building block for an Angular application. This is what an Angular component looks like. Uh, before we move on, I'll show you the service. And that service is actually just a simple class uh, that's being exported. And it has some basic information about me. Obviously, in a production application, you'd, you'd have a, a login, and, and this information would be populated from that. And then there's a, an array of rose bushes, which are what your, are your selections as you navigate through the application. 
Now I think it makes sense, since we sort of have the foundations for understanding what an angular component is, to take a look at the, um, at the parent component and the index that's at the foundation of the application. And you have some uh, imports here, obviously node modules. Uh, System.js is being used to load the modules in ES5. And then you have this single tag, myapp, which then loads the whole application. And behind that then, you have app.ts, And that then is bringing in not only uh, the component in view like we saw a few minutes earlier, it's bringing in some other things, bootstrap, uh, it's bringing in the route providers for routing, and then it's also importing each of the individual components. So welcome, plan, pick, and purchase are all uh, components in our application. And then those are bound uh, to this component. So this is the parent component MyApp is the selector that you saw on the, um, on the HTML screen I just showed. And then it itself has a template which is nav HTML. And we can take a look at that in just a minute. But here's how you do the route configuration. And it's pretty straightforward. I really enjoyed using this. This is component driven routing. And so all you have to do to set up your routing once you've imported your components is simply uh, designate a path for each of those, um, identify which components you're using, and you have an optional alias that you can add to it. And so uh, with that, the router is then injected into the display component and then, then bound uh, as part of the bootstrapping of the application. And then there's a location strategy that's added that just ha adds a hashtag uh, to the navigation as you, as you work through the system. So one nice thing about the routing here is that it's, it's fully baked into the, uh, to the component uh, design of, of Angular 2. And it, it's not an afterthought, it, it flows throughout the application. And there are certainly ways that you can take it further. You can do nested views and, and uh, different routing uh, from within parent and child components. Uh, the next uh, screen is the plan screen, and that brings us to just a little bit more in the way of uh, Angular-specific markup. And as you may recall, the, the screen that's here has a couple drop-downs uh, that allow for calculation of square footage, and then those are mapped to these uh, items that appear on the screen. And so if you look at this, I'm trying to get this so it shows on the screen. So let's just go to the end of this. Yeah, I think this is a little easier to see. Uh, you'll begin to see that there are some unusual tags in here. And this first one is is change, and that's a parentheses. And so you're starting to see the syntax for Angular 2 binding. That's, uh, that's event binding. So when you see a parentheses, you'll see an event that's bound to it. So in this case, it's set width. And then uh, there is also something called property binding, which is b binds values to properties. And in this case, it's, it, in that case, it uses square braces. And in this case, we're binding the selection of the item in the dropdown. And we're all, you'll also see something like this, NG4, which is an, uh, an, an Angular 2 directive. And that's um, been imported into this particular module. And that is uh, simply a for loop. It, it, seems, it should seem pretty obvious. And there are longhand ways to do this, but this is the shorthand that uh, Angular has developed for uh, for these particular directives. So you'll see another repeat of that, and then uh, some binding of the values. The uh, sort of mustache-like syntax should look familiar to folks. Uh, 
Uh, there's some if logic here that displays it only if the calculation is correct. And then at the very bottom, you have your router link, which um, again is fairly straightforward. It just points to a sister or sibling component of, the, um, of this component for navigation. Now, if you look at the uh, code behind here, you'll see that it's pretty straightforward. Again, we're injecting the shopping cart service, a router link, core directives. And then uh, we have a series of methods, set width, set length, set square footage, all of which do the calculations that you saw on the screen. Now, the important thing to understand here is not the simple JavaScript that I've created, but it's to understand the contract between the framework and the developer uh, out of the box. As I said earlier, Angular only uh, at this point supports one-way data binding. We'll see some options that you have to do essentially two-way data binding as we go forward. But at this point, the contract between the developer and the framework is that the framework will take care of the view and the display. So we don't need to do anything to update the view as you saw on the screen that we were looking at. But it is up to the developer to handle the events that, that are generated uh, by the users, and, and so you've got this code, um, which may seem a little different than the, the Angular 1 approach. So moving on to the uh, purchase screen, we have a little more flex, uh, complexity here. Uh, and as you recall, this one had a little more in the way of things going on, cascading dropdowns, running totals, and the ability to add and remove components. And so on this screen, if I go to the HTML, you'll start to see some, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong one. You'll start to see some additional uh, <coughs> this is where I wanted to be. You'll start to see some additional tags that, that are uh, similar to the ones on the previous screen, but we've added a few more. Uh, there is something here that looks very different, and that is we now have a combination of brackets and parentheses and we're using something called ng model, which actually comes from the form directives in Angular, but can be used outside of a form. And that is actually doing the equivalent of two-way data binding. So if you have a model behind this and you attach this uh, ng model to it, as I did here with the rows category, then what you're doing is you're essentially doing two-way data binding. Now this is not the old way of doing two-way data binding. There's still just one-way data binding in terms of the, the page recycling and the page flow. But Angular is smart enough to know that in these scenarios, what you want to do is update the model with the selection. And so it provides some syntactic sugar to do that. And then you have the, the, uh, the brackets, or I'm sorry, the parentheses for change events, uh, the binding of values as we saw on the previous screen. One thing that's really kind of nice here is that there are pipes available to format things. Uh, very cool. I, that really came in handy when I was working on this and needed to format my selections. And then uh, you have another link moving you on to the next page. Now, when you look at the code for this, uh, you may be taken aback a bit because uh, to get this working, you know, there's a fair amount of handling of events that, that had to go on. And, you know, as somebody who's done JavaScript development over the years, this is nothing new. There's nothing <laughs> dramatic about this. But the fact is that, uh, you know, this is part of the contract, as I mentioned a minute ago uh, with Angular 2, that, that it's incumbent upon the developer to actually uh, code the events. Now, having said that, 
in some ways I sort of need to take that back when I get to this final screen here, which is the screen where you're completing your purchase. Because this screen, uh, unlike the others, is actually using Angular forms. And so when you take a look at this, uh, you'll see something a little bit different. We've got a, obviously got a form tag that has an ng submit on it. Um, th this pound sign is a local variable that, rec that uh, sets the value of the form. And then on each of the input fields, you have something called ng control and ng model that are being uh, bound to the controls on the screen. And, and then there are the obvious things where you, uh, you've got the values, first name, last name, and so forth, that are bound to the model. And the, it's using this uh, ng model syntax, which is actually giving you the, the benefits of two-way binding. And one other thing to notice is that there's a custom element on this screen, show error, that's actually bound to another component that will be passed certain values, and then in that case, it will display the error screens that we show, uh, error displays that we saw earlier. But the good news is when you take a look at the code behind here, you see a lot less. Uh, in fact, this is just a calculation that I'm running from the previous screen to calculate the total amount, and that's pretty much it in terms of the code behind uh, the, the component itself. And um, so this is what Angular 2 provides for the common sort of forms over data uh, needs of most applications. And so increasingly you'll see that uh, you'll be able to use this in a way that feels comfortable from the standpoint of being able to write less code and do more um, you know, do more of the root development of, of your application. And in the, I think I've got a couple minutes left here, and why don't we go back to the slides and uh, just talk a little bit about what's next for Angular 2. I, Angular 2 and its release is sort of proceeding in stages, and I would say there are three stages that are in the short term, intermediate, and somewhat longer term. Uh, and the first is uh, finishing the core, doing some API sugaring, uh, performance improvements, and documentation. Documentation is sorely lacking, trust me on that one. This is all stuff that's pretty close to completion, or at least the Angular team promises it to us. We haven't seen all of it yet. But they are, I think, very close to finishing this off and then releasing a beta. And I would think the beta might come out within the next month. Then the next stage is migration support, animation, uh, bringing in material design, command line interface. It's a little clunky to get up and running with Angular 2 right now. This, I would say, it will not be in the initial beta, though there is material out there on uh, the GitHub site and on the Angular site about uh, how to migrate from one to two. And as I said earlier, you can actually run Angular one and two together side by side at this point. Uh, then there's another level uh, that goes beyond what we've been discussing and that involves server-side rendering, uh, native uh, support so that Things like React Native can be used with Angular 2, and running Angular 2 in a web worker. And that is stuff that was announced uh, near the end of the summer, but uh, from what I can tell, uh, there hasn't been, there, there's not readily available code that's been released. I think you can do server-side rendering. I think there was a workshop on that that was done a while back. But that is probably what will be um, the last part of this transition into Angular 2. I am not sure if that will actually be part of the initial Angular release. I think you might get one and two, and perhaps not three, but we'll just have to wait and see. And so when does Angular ship? Well, I think when they first came out with the announcement, it was late 2015. It's definitely not gonna be late 2015. I'm thinking the first quarter of uh, 2016, and um, 
and that would be ambitious. So we might see it in the first six months of uh, 2016. And uh, just to sum up what we've learned about Angular 2, first of all, it's mobile first design uh, with performance as a, a key consideration, support for evergreen browsers. It's built on emerging standards, web components, ES2015 and TypeScript. Uh, there's improved performance, and I hope that it's easier to learn, and I hope this demonstration has perhaps showed you some of the ease with which you can get into this. I would have to say that if you're working with an alpha right now, it's, it can be painful because things change out from underneath you in, in a moment's notice, but the goal is to make it easier to learn and comprehend, minimize the excess that may have developed with N uh, Angular 1 and the cross that built up over the years and focus it on components. And of course it uses TypeScript. So as far as resources are concerned, uh, you can go to Angular, Angular on their GitHub repository. That's where the code for Angular 2 is. Uh, the website for Angular 2 is angular.io. That's actually pretty much out of date at this point. Uh, they've got to update it. And then here are the, um, here's the GitHub repository for the presentation that I did today. And um, I hope in the short period of time that we've been together that you've at least gotten a sense for what makes up Angular 2, uh, the promise that it holds for development going forward. And um, I invite you to sort of jump in and give it a try. It's, it's reaching a point where it's stable enough to be able to do that. And I think we've run out of time. Yep, so if you have a question or two, you can catch me later.